Welcome to Roots in Christ Ministries. We are delighted to have you with us this Sunday. At Roots in Christ, we are committed to living in faith and loving in Christ. We pray that today's message will be a blessing to you, inspiring you to carry His love. We are also deeply grateful for your continued support. As you are led to contribute financially, we welcome your gifts of tithes, offerings, and donations. Links for giving are provided in the description section across all of our platforms, which include YouTube, Rumble, Facebook, and our website, www.thelettern.christ.net. Your generosity enables us to further the mission of sharing the gospel. Thank you for being a ministry partner with Roots in Christ Ministries. Peace and blessings in Jesus' name. My Lord, there's a lot of mess going on. But even in the Lord's house? Good morning and God bless Roots in Christ family. Thanks for joining us again this Sunday here at Roots in Christ Ministries, where we live in faith and we love after the love of Jesus Christ. Saints, I thank you for joining us couple of administrative uh, items I'd like to discuss. First and foremost, uh, I want to celebrate the retirement of my, or the soon coming retirement of my friend, a dear friend, uh, Command Sergeant Major Kelly. She had a celebration yesterday and I was unable to attend, but I want to express a heartfelt love and appreciation for uh, her and her service to this nation and I it was an honor for me to serve with her even but for a brief time period But it was an honor to serve with her uh, as a chaplain in the unit she was in but I thank God for you I value you and I encourage you to continue to let the Lord use you command sergeant major Kelly and the next call That he has for you. Amen. Amen uh, next, Lee Saints, I uh, shared with you about my aunt passing, my, my mother's sister passing away last week, and she had a homegoing celebration, and I want to continue to extend prayers to the family, but also I want to encourage you that, that Aunt Greta, Aunt Greta, even though we're going to miss her, we have an eternal promise that we will see her again in glory, and please continue to live in the loving spirit that she lived let me help you. Eternally lives in. That's right. I'm telling you, I, I've never met a sweeter woman. She's just as sweet and loving. And family, cousins, let's let's live in that. Let's continue to live in that, right? We'll thrive in that. <sighs> Lastly, and, and not even most significant, but I still want to express an importance. If you are blessed by today's message, please click the like button. And this is not me trying to fish for approval. This is me trying to get the gospel out, right? So if you'd press the like button as you were blessed and also those who have not subscribed, please subscribe in whatever platform you're on. Uh, just the way the algorithms work, the, the more numbers of people that, that are appreciating the ministry, the further it broadcasts and shares to others. And we want to get the gospel out, right? Amen, amen, amen. Tell you what, saints, not to delay. This Sunday, we are going to be coming from the book of First Kings, First Kings, starting at chapter one, First Kings, starting at chapter one, verse one, and it reads, now King David was old, advanced in age, and they covered him with clothes, but he could not keep warm. So his servants said to him, let them seek a young virgin for my Lord, the king, and let her attend the king and become his nurse and let her lie in your bosom that my lord the king may keep warm so they searched for a beautiful girl throughout all the territory of israel and found abishag the shunammite and bought her to the king the girl was very young oh i'm sorry the girl was very beautiful and she became the king's nurse and served him but the king did not cohabit with her in other words he did not have sex with her now Adonijah, the son of Haggith, exalted himself, saying, I will be king. So he prepared for himself chariots and horsemen with 50 men to run before him. His father had never crossed him at any time by asking, 
why have you done so? And he was also a very handsome man, and he was born after Absalom. He had conferred with Joab, the son of Zeruiah, and with Abiathar, the priest. And following Adonijah, they helped him. But Zadok, the priest, Beniah, the son of Jehoiada, Nathan, the prophet, Shimei, Rei, and the mighty men who belonged to David were not with Adonijah. Adonijah sacrificed sheep and oxen and fatlings by the stone of Zoheleth, which is beside Enrogel. And he invited all his brothers, the king's sons, and all the men of Judah, the king's servants. But he did not invite Nathan the prophet, Benaiah, the mighty men, and Solomon, his brother. I want to use as a subject this Sunday, the few, the faithful, the Christian. The few, the faithful, the Christian. I'd like to use as a subtopic, too much drama in God's house. Too much drama in God's house. You know, there was a time where people used to say, and, and I'm saying it like they still don't say it, but but they'd make the comment, there's no way I'm going into that church house. I don't, I'm not going to church. There's more drama. There's more trouble. There's more strife in the church than in the world. In fact, the people in the church are worse than the people in the world. How many of us would say hallelujah, amen to that? Yeah, yeah. On the other side, how many would say, well, the devil's a liar and the truth is not in him? Any amens on that one? I'll tell you, saints, I'm one that um, I would argue that people that present this argument, there is a certain expectation they have in the church. There's a certain expectation they have. And when I say in the church, I'm talking about the people. They expect the people to be a little bit more godly. They expect the people in the church to live by a higher standard, right? Because it's God's standard. And even that said, I think they expect us to have a more godly focus. And that's, that's a realistic expectation, right? It is. The thing is, though, there's a fallacy with this expectation. Because if you know the perfect church, I'm here to tell you, you've already moved into glory. Amen? You moved into glory. But I think what you'll find in what we call a perfecting church is the church evangelizing and bringing in and encouraging the Galatians chapter 5 starting at verse 22 people. That's right. Your Every church ought to be inviting and bringing in Galatians chapter 5 verse 22 people. We bring these people in. Well, Pastor, what's Galatians chapter 5 verse 22? I'm glad you asked that question. I hope my note takers took that, but just to, to give you what we're, what we're looking at, we're looking at people whose, whose works are of the flesh and they're evident through how they are sexually immoral. They are impure. They're sensual. They're idolatrous. They are sorcerers. Uh, yeah. Miss Cleos. They're a bunch of Miss Cleos, right? <laughs> There, there's enmity, there's strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, jealousy, drunkenness, and orgies. I already said jealousy, right? But the thing is, saints of God, these are the people that we will come, come worship with us. Pastor, you lost your mind. No, no, that's what evangelism is. Some of us were some of these people. And if no one shared the gospel with us, how could he, how would we even perceive there would be a change in us unless the preacher preached? And the thing is, we don't bring these people into the church so that we can beat them up, so that we can change them. You can't change anybody. As a matter of fact, if you change somebody, I'm telling you, you just took them to a new level of imperfection. But we know that this transition from death to life comes from a relationship with God. It comes from getting to know God. So today I even make the argument, not only should the church be inviting these people to the church, the church should be investing in these people so that they can live in the same transformation that we live in. And that is unto the Lord by his spirit. The church should bring change to the lives of everyone that we meet. And let, let me go to the next level with it. Not just in the church house, but wherever you are. 
That's what evangelism is. Your pulpit is wherever you are. People would be drawn in by how you live. Let me let me keep going. That's another sermon for another day, but but it directly aligns up with where we're going in today's message. Here in our text, we find David has grown old and he's become unable to keep warm. So his advisors find a beautiful young woman, a virgin, to keep him warm. And I know some of you, look, I remember David. I mean, he's the same one that was checking out Bathsheba when he should have probably been at war, right? This David, he wants a virgin in his bed. And, and please understand, saints, we already identified that David is not having sex with this virgin. But in fact, in the ancient Near East cultures, it's culturally common for body warmth to be used to keep people warm, particularly when there's hypothermia. But then also in, uh, for a lot of older people in order to get the radiated warmth that comes from another body. Right. A lot of older people just got got cold. But but here's the thing, saints of God, the reason for the choice of the virgin is simply to alleviate some of the complexities that would would come if, let's say, your wife was called by the king, a married woman called by the king to come and keep him warm. No, mm -mm. nope. I can't think of one man that claims to be a man that would say, all right, well, for God and country. <laughs> right. You, you better find someone else. But but not only that, saints, but but also if she already had children, I mean, now you have the kids going at night, where's mama? Where's mama? So it just got rid of all of those complexities. But then, saints God, I want us to recognize, and this is where we're beginning to draw closer to my, my, my subject and my message. The thing is that this story actually serves as a narrative toward the purpose in a broader context of the transition of power, right? And we're, 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 we recognize that transitions of power is just like we had in uh, the most recent presidential election, whereas one president, the, the uh, incumbent president would welcome the president-elect and do a transition, right? But then what we're looking at here is there's an illegitimate transition, an illegitimate transition. Here we find that David's frailty and his dependence on Abishag, right? This this virgin woman highlights his inability to lead his people anymore. He can't do it on his own. Once David, a warrior king, now he needs a virgin to keep him warm. But even what's worse about this is his own son is serving as a snake in the grass. Somebody look at your neighbor and say, there's always a snake in the grass. There's always a snake in the grass. There's always a snake in the grass and they're always looking for your weakness. They're looking for cracks in your armor and they're looking for a way not to help you, but in order to usurp you and to take your position. In other words, there are people that are working against you. And even that's why in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, it tells us to be, so, be of a sober spirit, to be on the alert because your adversary, the devil, is roaming like a roaring lion, seeking who he may devour. Satan is looking for your chinks in your armor. He's looking for any way he can insert himself into your life so that he can chew you up and spit you out. And that's what we're seeing as a conspiracy in our text here, saints. So we have uh, Adonijah, who is Solomon's half-brother, and he attempts to crown himself as king of his father's kingdom. He's, he's trying to make himself the king. But here's, here's my thing. If you look beside him, he was being helped by Joab, right? He was, he was the commander of David's armies at one point, and you've got Abiathar, the priest. <clears throat> he invited most of the royal officials and then even David's, some of David's uh, uh, sons to attend the sacrifice at, uh, in Rogel. And basically what this was is like an ordination service or a, a celebration, almost in a sense, to make what is illegitimate in the transition of power from David to uh, Adonijah to look legitimate. Somebody look at your neighbor and say, it looked legitimate. It, it did. It did. It did. But here's my thing, saints of God. I'm not even focusing on Adonijah. I'm not because this stuff happened back in those times. And yes, it's a sermon for another day, but I'm always one that not only, I, I, I recognize 
the leaders, but I want to see who's supporting these leaders. And here we find in the thick of things, in the thick of this snake in the grass is the grubs that are around him that are just messing stuff up. We've got Joab, right? Joab's an OG. And if you were to look at his resume again, I've, I've shared with you that he was the commander of David's armies, but he was also David's nephew. That's right. He was his sister's son, his, his sister Zuria. Uh, but the thing is that he played a critical role in a lot of David's victories of the kingdom, right? David actually becoming king. Joab was a part of that. And he, he was actually loyal to David, or at least gave the appearance of being loyal to David because he fought ferociously and viciously alongside David. But the thing is, he had a pattern of disobedience to David, direct disobedience to David. But hold on, pastor, if you're fighting, fighting with me, you know what I'm saying? We, we in support of me, I, I can't be as critical of you because you're the one that helped me get to where I am, right? Well, let me, let me help you a little bit. If we look at some of his disobedience, disobediences, we find that Abner, who was the uh, former commander of Saul's army, remember David and uh, Saul's armies, uh, they fought. Uh, David actually had a meeting with or a negotiation of peace with Abner. And then David agreed, they agreed to the terms. And then he sent Abner on his way in peace. But the thing is that Joab was angry of, uh, of Abner's role in the death of his brother, Asahel. That's right. In other words, this, this is like some blood and crip stuff, right? Well, he killed my brother and I don't care if there's peace. I, I need to get vengeance. And even with David's diplomatic efforts, you find that Joab was one who undid the work. He undid the work and then David in himself, he had to declare innocence. And it was like, no, I, I, I had nothing to do with this. This wasn't me. In other words, Joab's actions created division and unnecessary dissension amongst what was established as peace. David had to condemn Joab. And I know, I know what you're saying. You're like, all right, well, well, look, pastor, that's just one time. And at the end of the day, he did it for his brother. He did it for his brother. Okay, well, well let me keep going. Just make sure you remember this. You find that uh, during the battle against Dave, David against his son Absalom, he had uh, Absalom had rebelled against David, and David explicitly instructed Joab and the army to deal gently with Absalom. Deal gently with my son. This is my son. I know we're at war, but I need you to deal gently with him. What does Joab do during the war? Joab finds Absalom hanging from a tree by his hair. By his hair. So what does Joab do? He kills him. He kills him. And understand that Joab saw Absalom as a potential threat to the kingdom's stability. His actions defied David's order blatantly. And you may say, all right, well, I, I hear that. I hear that. But he did it for God and country. And, and, and he did what David couldn't do. And he, it's okay that he's the bad guy because somebody had to be it, right? But it was defiance against the king. Let me, let me keep going. You, you, can, you can have that argument. Now, I'm not saying it's right, but then now you find where uh, after uh, Absalom's rebellion, David replaced Joab as commander of the army with Amasa, who was formerly the commander of Absalom's, uh, Absalom's forces. Now, David ordered Amasa to assemble the troops to deal with a new rebellion led by Sheba. And then now, once again, you have Joab recognizing, hold on, he's taking my job and he murders Amasa. He murders Amasa. And the thing is, he murdered him under the guise of them actually meeting in a friendly, in a friendly place, being friendly, right? But the thing is, this was, this was not under David's authorization and it was directly opposed to David's confirmation of a mass of being now the commander. Saints of God, some of you may say, well, all right, well, look, he was fighting for his job. And you know how unemployment is. He, he had to feed his family too. 
But now here in our text in 1 Kings chapter 1, where we find and we recognize that David had implicitly designated Solomon as his chosen successor, we've got Adonijah, Abiathar the priest, and we've got Joab, Joab conspiring against David for the throne that David had already established. For the throne that David had already designated to go to King Solomon, saints of God. Understand that, that this is what we call a coup. And it is, it is a direct act against David's will, but it's a direct act against God's will. Now, I want to talk about us, saints of God, because sometimes we go through life and we have little things that pop up in our life and they seem to catch us off guard. But but I'm here to tell you that that David, David himself, if he he recognized that Joab was a danger and that's even why he he had to replace some saints of God. There are people in our lives that are potential threats and dangers to our future because we allowed him to get away with mess and the signs are here today. How many of you have dated somebody and they've cheated on you once and they cheated on you twice and then they cheat on you a third time and you just are heartbroken so hard either that third time or you become numb to the point where you know what? It doesn't even matter anymore. And then we're, we're curious and caught off guard when they do more horrendous offenses. But the thing is, saints of God, if God has given you a sign, an indication, a warning of something, then at the end of the day, we need to use discretion and discernment. Not only that, and, and this goes out to, and I've married couples where the husband or the wife has been married two or three, four, five times before. And even during our counseling sessions, what makes this any different? And I'm telling you, when you are dating somebody that's been married so many times before, you need to do your inspector gadget your your uh what's, what's the guy's name uh, uh peter folk you know what i'm saying you need to do your investigation you need to know what's going on in these people's minds and their heads and their attitudes what's going on was he a bad wife picker was she a poor husband selector or is it something in them is it something in them that's just just not right? Something in them that's just not working or collecting or clicking well with the person that they're supposed to be with for the rest of their life. What's going on? Columbo, Peter Falk, Columbo. The thing is, saints, that's from our old people, older people, by the way, right? But the thing is, saints of God, even those of us, we, we have some friends that we hang out with and when it's one-on-one -on -one with them, right? It's all cool, it's all dap, it's all love. When we get around other people now, they want to joke. They want to joke on you. They want to make you the butt of joke. Saints of God, the signs are there. You got to recognize, saints of God, that with Joab showing the frequency of totally denying and being disobedient to what God has and what God has directed shows a few things. Number one, it shows his prioritization to himself, his feelings, his emotions, his desires, his will, his position, and it does not consider the king's direct order, nor does it consider God's will. Now, saints, we have people in our lives, in our offices, in our homes. We have people in our churches that place their priority of themselves over any and everything else. They, they do. And you see it quite often in churches where, where the pastor may get ill and then you'll see the, the ministers begin to jockey so that they can get in their position. You don't just see it at the at the preacher level either. You see it in all of the, in the deacons and the ushers. You see it everywhere where people in the house of God want to jockey and fight for themselves to be in a position. But the thing is, saints of God, specifically in the text that we're reading, we're finding that David had already established his plan for succession. I'm here to tell you, saints of God, that God has already established his order in the church. And it's a matter of us finding our position where God placed us and places us in the church to be used by him. But the warning is always, when you see this stuff going on, just, just sit back and take a look and, and think historically where people have been for you and been with you and worked for you and worked against you. If, if you bit me once, shame on you. If you bite me twice, 
and as, as Donald, as uh, not Donald Trump, but as George Bush would say, well, well uh, bite me twice. Well, uh, the, the thing is, you just can't bite me again. Amen. Let's let's go to Bible. It doesn't matter what I say. What does the Bible say? Romans chapter 16, verse 17. It says, now I urge you, brethren, keep your eye on those who cause dissensions and hindrances contrary to the teaching which you've learned and turn away from them. Turn away from them. For such men are slaves, not of our Lord Christ, but of their own appetites. And by their smooth and flattering speech, they deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting. So not only are these people malicious, but also they what they do is they throw dirt in your face and try to tell you it's raining. Oh yeah, yeah we know some slick talking rascals out here, right? They try to, they, they'll show you one thing, one side of them, but then they'll explain it another way. And you, you oh, okay, I, I see. I, I, I see. The thing is, saints of God, Paul is advising us as believers that not only should we be vigilant but all in identifying these people, but also we need to avoid these individuals who create divisions and create dissensions and they act against, hear this, specifically God's teachings. They act against God's teaching. I'm sorry, saints. I make decisions in my life based on how people live according to God's word. And it's not that I, 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 I uh, 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 look at belittling people who don't live according to God's word because I take my call to evangelism very seriously. But the thing is, I am going to find myself if you are not just have your mind made up that you're not going to trust in God and you're not going to live accordingly. I've got to get away from you. I, I do, I do. And and part of the reason for this is, saints of God, is I don't want your negative influence to rub off on me. If the Jesus in me isn't rubbing off on you and you still continue to walk in a hellbound direction, I'm here for you over here when you're ready to come over here. But I can't be there walking with you to damnation. I can't do it. Can't do it. I've spoken too much about Joab. Let me keep going. Um, uh, I really want to talk about Abi Abiathar the priest or Abiathar the priest. So here's the problem. Abiathar the priest, he was supporting Adonijah here in our text in 1 Kings. And uh, the thing is that in his support of Adonijah, he is in direct opposition against uh, God's will and is in direct opposition to King David's authority regarding the rightful succession of the throne. In other words, he took a position as though he knew better than King David or he knew better than, than God. Let's break this down. So you have Adonijah who sought to make himself king as David grew old and frail. Uh, however, David had already made it clear that Solomon was chosen by God to succeed him. Let me say this again. Solomon was chosen by God to see him. And this is what we find in first Chronicles chapter 22 verses nine through 10. The thing is by Abiathar aligning with Adonijah, he was supporting an unauthorized rule. Hear this, an unauthorized bid for power. And it directly defied God's will. Be careful of people that directly defy God's will. Be careful of them. Be careful of them. The thing is that this not only undermines David's uh, authority, but it also works in a role uh, with Abiathar, Abiathar, uh, Abiathar being the priest. It works uh, as a role in almost trying to legitimize something that is illegitimate. You don't expect this from your priest. Yeah, yeah. Somebody said there's drama in God's house. You don't expect this from the minister of God. And that's even why you'll find that pastors, when I'm careful of these ministers out here that begin to preach false doctrine and false gospels, they're trying to legitimize sin. Preachers that will defend what God says is sin is not godly. And I've got to be careful of you. And even to the point where we can sit and we can talk and, and we can go to God's word in this. But if you are going to deny and defy God's word, we are not walking in fellowship. We have preachers out here that will twist up scripture. They don't even, and, and, and it's easy to see, right? Because you can go to the text before and go to the text after and it clarifies the text. But preachers will twist and manipulate and misinterpret biblical scriptures to justify sinful behavior. 
They'll quote isolated scriptures. And even I've heard preachers even say, well, we can't judge. But and, and they'll only take a portion of Matthew chapter seven, missing the fact that God calls us to judge, but to judge justly. And this is not judgment to damnation, but really what it is, is it's really a form of, what did I say we need to use? We need to use discretion. We need to use discernment. We need, we, we have to, we have to. You can't redefine sin and tell me it's a good thing. And when I begin to see preachers do this, claiming cultural relevance, it's like this in certain cultures. I'm sorry, in whatever culture it is, sin is sin is sin. And don't even try to butter, uh, butter it up or, or soft soak and say, well, it's just a mistake. It's just a, a flaw. Everybody makes mistake. We all fall short. of the, well, Okay, well, well, you go ahead and justify that sin. Let's see where that leads you. trying to overemphasize grace and, re and, and, and not emphasize repentance. Those of you that know me, you could come short of slapping me in my face. Notice I said come short. You need to come, you need to come short of it. And I'll forgive you. I, I will. And, and I say all this, but the truth is, I'm a very forgiving person because I know the same person I was yesterday is not the person I am today. And I know that God has done a work in me. And if he can do this in a rascal like me, then I know he could do it in any and everybody else. But but even as God is doing this work, there's a, a, a process towards a repentance. That means we turn away. We ask for forgiveness and we turn away from our sin. And then even in our turning away, we need to avoid. Hear this. That we need to avoid sin, but we don't avoid the topic of sin. And what I'm getting at is, is there are preachers who won't even preach sin. And now you have a church full of people that I would say don't even know the dangers. Because if you're only telling me a portion of the Bible and you aren't preaching the fullness of what God has for me, I don't know what to look for in your life or in my life. You're on the preachers today, aren't you, Pastor? I am. I am. I am. Why? Because there's too many of us up here that people are following us. And if we're leading them down the wrong path, then we're only walking them straight into judgment. We're walking people into death. And we can't permit sin. We can't permit the preaching or condoning, condoning sin. But we have to make sure we don't legitimize sin. Abiathar attempted to legitimize sin. A spiritual deception that leads people away from the truth of God's word. The thing is, saints of God, when we legitimize sin, there is a loss of salvation. And we are encouraging sin without repentance. And the result is, hear this, spiritual death which is really the eternal death. And us ministers are held accountable for making sure that we preach life and life more abundantly. But part of that is making sure that we've walked away from, we encourage walking away from sin. We live by the higher standard that God has established for us to live by, not in condoning sin. Preachers are called to boldly proclaim the truth of the gospel which includes addressing sin and directing people to repentance. The thing is, saints of God, if you're not careful, we'll miss what God is trying to do because we're focused on what we want to do. Let me take us home with this. Abithar, he played a role in dividing the nation. He created conflict during a time where it was already delicate. And the thing is, Abithar's role should have been to guide the people toward a greater unity under God's community. Greater unity under God's community. He missed an opportunity to encourage a spiritual stabilization. And then even as he would support Adonijah, Abiathar the priest, should have been one to warn Adonijah that your act is a defiance to God's will. And to partner with 
Joab in this. Now you have the spiritual concurrence. And then also now you have the military concurrence. The unfortunate side of this is it only compounds the seriousness of the sin. Now, I'm a minister of the gospel. I'm called to preach an unadulterated truth. And the thing is, I want us to be careful as we continue. And, and I'm, I'm talking any, anyone and anywhere, wherever you are. Most recently, us here in the United States, we just had a, a presidential election. The thing is, saints of God, that during this election, we had two candidates that 20 to 30 years ago would not have even seriously been, been considered. And I'm talking about just based on their, their history, based on their actions, based on their speech. Neither one of them would have been seriously considered. The thing is, saints of God, I always encourage, if you've joined us before a minute, I encourage you, number one, pray for the president that's in office, number two, before you vote. You make sure you pray so that you're guided by the Holy Spirit in who to vote for. Now, Here's the other side of this thing is as you vote, I'm not entitled to tell you how your convictions should be. In other words, if you voted for Donald Trump, you voted for Donald Trump. I'm not mad at you and I could care less if you could not care less. If you voted for uh, uh, Kamala Harris, I could not care less that you voted for her. As long as you acted upon the conviction that God has invested in you, what are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying if you voted for Donald Trump and you didn't even pray to God to ask him, God, who should I vote for? You acted in your own Joab-like interest. Your own Abiathar-like interest. And the thing is, just because I care who you voted for. God cares who you voted for without asking him. Some of us will have a tendency to vote because of how I feel. What we think we see and there's so many lies and deceptions out there. You're blind and, uh, 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 to the truth because we just don't know. We don't know the total truth. But guess who does? God does. And that's why we go to God and ask him, Lord, who should I vote for? There should be some conviction on us to make sure that we ask God to guide us into his will. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse starting at verse 22, and it reads, For indeed, Jews ask for signs and Greeks search for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to Jews, a stumbling block into Gentiles' foolishness. But to those who are the called, let me say this again, but to those who are the called, Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong <clears throat> and the base things of the world. And the, excuse me, and the despised God has chosen the things that are not so that they may nullify the things that are so that no man may boast before God. Saints of God. Here, this text right here underscores that God often works in ways that defies our logic and defies our expectation. That's right. There are things that we want in our life, how we want them. But if we don't ask God, we don't really know what to expect because it is these things that seem logical that are really foolishness to us, but it's really the wisdom of God. Understand, saints of God, what the world might dismiss and what they may call foolish or insignificant, God majors in revealing the wisdom, his power, and confounding those with your worldly ways of understanding and so-called wisdom. For the believer... We're encouraged in humility and to trust in God. I don't know who you voted for, don't care who you voted for, but God is in control and I believe that God's will is being done. Why? Because I believe in God. I believe in him. I believe his wisdom surpasses our 
understanding. And that's why I just want to be reminded and I want to remind you to make sure that we live a life that's worthy of our calling and trusting God. For the preachers and for the teachers, we need to make sure that we boldly proclaim the gospel even when it's counter, hear this, counter-cultural. It's against everything that the culture is moving and walking in. We need to make sure that we place our importance upon relying upon God and not human wisdom. For it is by our faith and people watching us where we find that people will be drawn and led to Christ because what seemed foolish to them yesterday, they begin to see it. Understand, saints of God, that the gospel invites any and everyone, regardless of our status, regardless of our background, to receive salvation through Jesus Christ. And I say all this to say, it's all towards Christ. It's all towards God's purpose. It's all toward the, 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 the sufficiency of the grace that he bestowed upon us for us to make sure that the world hears and that the world, though they may not understand, begin to see us as living in samples or living examples of what a believer is. When people look at the church, they, should, they, they recognize we are the few. They recognize we are the faithful. They recognize we are the believers. And since we recognize all of the turmoil, sometimes it takes place in the church house, in, in God's house. All of the turmoil is God doing his work toward perfecting the saints. God doing his work to knead out all of the bubbles, the cracks, the imperfections. God is doing his work to transition us to a life that glorifies him. So if truly as we see outsiders looking at us inside the four walls of the church and people on the outside that see us as members of the body of Christ that want to argue that there's too much drama in God's house, I'm here to tell you that drama is God doing his work to perfect the saints, to strengthen us, to encourage us, to mold us and shape us. And some of us, and I can only talk about me, have imperfections or had imperfections that require just a little bit more work, amen? But my encouragement to you is to be open and available to let God do that work in you, his temple, to do that work in you, in your heart, in your mind, so that we no longer see the world from our own perspectives and our own eyes, but we see the direction that God wants to take us individually and collectively as the body of Christ. Amen. Eternal and almighty Lord, we thank you again for this time that you've afforded us to celebrate and to live in the love that you've prepared for us. Dear Lord, we recognize that even as Abiathar the priest was not one who looked for you as his priority. Dear Lord, our encouragement and, and even our query to you is, Lord, any imperfections that you see in us that are of self-interest, we ask that you remove them from us, remove them from our minds, our hearts, but allow your Holy Spirit to flourish in, in us, dear Lord. <clears throat> is that you give the hearer and the believer the desire to draw closer to you so that regardless of whatever decisions need to be made, be it supporting people or be it walking away and finding ourselves separated from people, be it voting for the president of the United States or voting for the president of our homeowners associations, regardless of the decisions that we make, we come to you first for your will, your desire, and your purpose. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God.